Again, Lodis, thank you for having me. Uh, again, uh, who was here last year and saw the DNS talk? I did on the DNS flag day. Wonderful. <laughs> who actually did some any any actions in order to fix their infrastructures? Wonderful. I have stickers for DNS flag day survivors. <coughs> Come see me after the talk, and I'll, I'll hand them to you. Uh, today, I'm not going to talk about DNS at all. I think. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about system DN spawn and how to run containers and operating system images within it. So, uh, I'm Peter. I used to be a sysadmin. Now I'm kind of a developer. Uh, still love the sysadmin stuff for the containerization things. Um, I started doing N spawn by accident. I wanted to install um, Mastodon, the federated uh, Twitter, to, to say. And their installation instructions were get a Ubuntu 18.04 machine. Shit, I'm running Arch on my server, which is a bad choice to start with. <laughs> However, that was the choice I made, and um, I'm stuck with it. And so my next thought was, okay, I can do this in Docker. And then I realized, well, Docker doesn't really integrate within the, the, the service management that is already in place there, because Arch Linux really uses systemd. Then I found out about systemd and spawn, I'm like, fuck it, let's see how this works. And I kind of like it. It works well in production. Uh, it's, it's missing some bits and pieces when it comes to the management. Uh, I'll explain it later. But in general, I think it's really cool. And I want you guys to learn about it as well. So, what is systemd and spawn? Here's a very nice quote from the man page. Uh, it is a tool that is included, I'm not going to read it, you can, you can read it yourself. It is a tool that's included within the systemd uh, suite of tools, uh, I think since like <coughs> system 229, which is already quite old. Um, it is fully integrated within systemd, that means all the, all the other tools like systemctl, uh, journalctl, uh, system D analyze all integrate with this uh, with this end spawn. So you can uh, I was going to show that later as well. You can inspect your containers with the regular tools on the host. Uh, and the man pages are wonderful. Everything's in there. Like 95% of this presentation is based solely on the information I found in the man pages. Uh, hardly any blogs were read. So. How does it compare to other container technologies? So when you, I guess everybody here knows Docker, or has played with it at some point in their lives. So when you compare system D and spawn to Docker, um, it is, it is, it is down scope. There is no image creation included. There is no image distribution included. There is no, nothing like Docker pool. Uh, images are not layered. Containers are considered, uh, you have the container image and you boot the actual image. So it's not something that is layered that you can throw away. It is more persistent than within Docker. So when you're talking about running things in Nspawn, it is not about a container workload, which is usually short-lived. This is more long-lived processes. Uh, there is no multi-node orchestration. Uh, you could probably build this yourself on top of this, but there is no Kubernetes integration or what have you. And uh, versus Docker, again, the nice thing is all the processes are managed by systemd directly, and you have control via your host over all of this, and I'm going to show you some nice screenshots about it as well. Uh, when you're looking uh, to systemd and spawn and ch root, uh, System the Spawn fully virtualizes the file system hierarchy. Um, <coughs> it also does all the sandboxing, and chroot does not have namespaces or cgroups at all. So you, you buy in a little bit more security and namespacing. Uh, when you compare it to LXC, I don't have a lot of experience with LXC, so the only thing I could come up with is LXC is a little bit more low level, but it uses the same kernel primitives as Nspawn does. And when you're looking at libvirt, KVM, Camu, these kinds of technologies uh, within Nspawn, no kernel is booted. It just runs the init or uh, whatever the process is that you want to run from the container. And, uh, and it just uses the resources available on the host OS. And uh, when you're running these kinds of systems with libvirt and KVM, the introspection has to be done from within the machine itself. You cannot really introspect the whole virtual machine from your host. 
unless you do some really uh, weird SSH tricks, but then it's still not introspection from the host. So how would you start working on an Anspawn if you would, would want to do this? And I can recommend at least playing around with it. So this is what you could do. You could, do, you could the bootstrap a Debian stretch. Uh, you can install some, you can uh, set the password, otherwise you can't log in. You can enable network D. If you don't enable network D within the container, uh, it won't have an IP address if you boot it because it will get a virtual Ethernet interface, so it needs to do some DHCP. Uh, there are other networking options that I'll get to later. <coughs> and as you can see, the options, I'll explain them later. But this minus D just means this directory, and SP2 means please insert a small shim into the, into the container. Uh, many of you using Docker, uh, I think nowadays Docker has a key that actually also inserts a small uh, in it, into the container that actually handles the signals correctly. Uh, and then with the minus B switch, you can actually boot it. So this is a uh, very dark screenshot, which is even darker on this screen. I'll, uh, I'll put it the slides later. Uh, basic, if you can see a little bit, this is just a normal boot sequence, so you see all the services starting. <laughs> all right, that's fine. Uh, on my oh, screen, no, it looked no. very nice. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so you, you can just boot a container from a directory, and you just get this. You get a login prompt as you would have on a normal uh, machine, and you can just uh, log in as root if you've set the password correctly. So how, how does the command line of system DN spawn work? Uh, there are two big difference. There are two major options. First one is system DN spawn, then some options and a command to run within the container or boot it with some options and pass the arguments to the init or at least the, the bit uh, number one within the container. Uh, also, if you're, if you're running systemdn spawn, you don't have to run a full operating system inside the container. You can run a single uh, binary as well. Um, so what kind of options are there? there are category, I've categorized them. Uh, everything is also in the man page categorized. It's super nice, like I said. So you have directory. You can just use a debootstrapped or DNF installed or backstrapped directory directly from NSpawn. So I can, in any directory, create a OS tree and then boot it. And it works. Uh, same thing with image. You can just get a disk image, uh, raw, QCOW, whatever, and feed it to Nspawn and it can boot directly from this image. Uh, you can use a template. So you can have an image or a directory and create a new machine based on this directory. So for instance, if I would do systemd Nspawn, dash dash template is my machine, which is a directory, minus minus image, my other machine, it will create the my other machine. Uh, if you're if you're doing this with directories and you're running on ButterFS, it will actually use copy on write, so it won't uh, by default. So it won't do any weird copying tricks unless your file system requires that. Uh, you have the ephemeral switch, which allows you that uh, comes close to what Docker does by default uh, when it comes to images. This means it will boot the image, but there will be an overlay, and once the container is killed, everything's gone that you changed. So you can run in a read-only mode. Yeah, ask a yes, I'll in, the the in the directory mode, if I would then change a file and slash it to see whatever, that is persisted down into the directory. Yes, yeah. yes. Unless you're running in a uh, ephemeral mode oh, or sorry. within a volatile uh, mode, yes. So there are several execution options, like I said. Uh, minus B or minus minus boot. Uh, system the Nspawn will actually search the OS tree for an init process and, uh, and run it. <coughs> you have the SPIT2, so it inserts a small shim, so all signal handling is done correctly. Uh, you can have, if you're running, uh, for instance, a small single application, you can even make it do system denotify to actually tell the service manager of the host, hey, I have booted correctly. 
And when it comes to networking, there are a bunch of options, as Linux has a million networking options anyway. Uh, the most simplest option is, of course, just give the namespace, the networking namespace of the host to the, to the container. Uh, that will give the container access to all the devices uh, and it can control it. There is uh, a network virtual ethernet, so it will create a interface on the host and one on the container. It will link it via virtual ethernet and on the inside you can do DHCP and on the outside a small DHCP server is running by, uh, with system, uh, by system D. We'll give the container an IP and you have all the internet you want. Uh, within uh, these modes, by the way, uh, it depends on the option that you give, but usually it will copy the resolve comp from the host into the container or bind mount it, depending on what you want. So you, if you use, uh, if you use, uh, if you use some special DNS, your container will also use this special DNS server. Uh, you have the network bridge command. This will attach the container to an existing network bridge on your on your host system. You can have the MAC VLAN, which creates a MAC address on an, uh, on one of the interfaces and bridges it into the container, so the container can do DHCP on your own network. And the same thing with, you can actually assign it a full interface as well. So if you have a machine with several interfaces, you can just give a move, technically an interface from the namespace of the host to the namespace of the container, and then the container has full control of this interface. And by the way, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Uh, it has a lot of networking, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, file system and uh, directory tricks you can do. You can do some bind mounts to bind a directory from the host into the container. You can do that read-only if you want. You can even do overlays, so you can have multiple directories on the host, overlaid, presented to the container as a single directory tree somewhere in its file system. Uh, this can allow you to do nice things like having a container run in read-only mode but have one directory that is writable which is which exists on the host and might be accessible by other processes as well. Uh, there is username spacing. Uh, this, this usually comes in handy when you're running this as, service, as a service. I will explain this later as well. Um, you can set the dash dash private users setting. Uh, usually if you just put, put it on yes or without any equals uh, sign in there, it will automatically pick 65,000 numbers uh, at a multiple of 65,000. So it will map the users within the container to high numbered user IDs on the host. Um, because you're, you're working with directories, you have of course the file permissions of the, of the host there. So there's the option private users shown, uh, which is uh, when you're running a container as a service set by default as well. It will actually recursively shown the directory that you run the container from. So the image directory, which is owned by root, will be owned by some user ID that is zero within the container, but a large number outside of the container. And uh, system D will pick this, uh, will pick the start number as a multiple of 64K, and will always stick to the same one as long as you use the same name for the container, because it, uh, it, it picks it based on the name, does some hashing uh, for that. Um, and then I have the shortcut to do it both, so this is one of the shortcuts that actually run within the, uh, within the service. <coughs> Uh, and the first time I, I, I did this, I was super confused because I, I ran the container a few times to, to just do some installation. So I just did things at SP2 and everything was still owned by root root, okay. And then I booted it once with the minus U option and then everything was owned by weird users and then I ran it without this option and then system D in the container was complaining that the user modes were wrong. So if you, if you do the choning, then you have to stick to the user IDs that have been used before or re-chone everything. That's uh, one of the things I uh, realized. So if you want to run containerized services, how, how could you 
How could you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just in the, so you just write a unit file. So within that unit, so in this unit file, you just we create a super simple surface. We say, okay, run and spawn. <coughs> do the uh, user spa, um, do the user uh, namespacing. As you can see, there are no networking options here, so this will use the host networking stack. Uh, run this QCAL image as uh, as your root file system, and within that image, run the user bin foo a pro uh, program with the minus D switch. Uh, whatever user bin foo might be, and what the minus D switch uh, might mean, I don't. It is not relevant here, but this will just boot a namespaced, or at least user namespace container within the host networking namespace. And if the foo server would be configured to listen on all addresses on a certain port, it will actually listen on the host address on that port. Um, because this is just system B, you can give it capability bounding sets, so you can already do uh, CPU uh, uh, restrictions, memory restrictions, CPU pinning, all these kinds of things. Uh, you can limit the amount of files the container can open, and uh, and you can even have it be installed and run at a certain uh, at a certain target as well. You, you actually don't need to write that service file. Sorry. You actually don't need to write that service file. No, you don't you have to. You already include one. Yes, I will. This is my next slide. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for asking. <laughs> so it is super shit to write this yourself. So there is a systemd nspawn at service file included when you install nspawn. Um, what this uh, what this does? It starts and spawn with some with a bunch of options. Uh, most importantly, the boot. So by default, it will always boot. It will always run the virtual uh, Ethernet. It will always do the do the chunk trick. However, there is a settings override function um, that I'll that I'll get into. But this will allow you to override any of the command line switches that are set here with a drop-in file. Um, it, is, it will actually notify because system D realizes it is running within nspawn in the container and will send a notify over the socket to the host system saying, hey, I have started correctly, which usually happens when I think multi-user.target is, uh, is started. Uh, and uh, you have a watchdog. It actually runs in a separate, uh, group, in a separate slice as well. And uh, it has uh, it has very limited permissions in the end. And you can see uh, it is this service file is wanted by machines.target. This is a target that I think on all the Debian's is not enabled by default. But if you enable this machines.target within the host system, it will boot all the system D and spawn at whatever services that you have uh, enabled. So sometimes you don't want all these options. Maybe you just wanted to have the host namespace or run a single process or don't join uh, any of the file systems or have, have any other options that I mentioned before or use a different image. Uh, there are several places where you can put these configuration overrides. You can put them in etc, system the spawn, name of the machine dot spawn. I should mention here you can see as well, it will actually name the machine uh, after whatever you call it, after the app, <coughs> uh, that is a nice way to keep track of what, what it's actually doing. For instance, you can call it Mastodon, as, uh, as is one of my, uh, my containers is called. Um, <coughs> <coughs> and uh, you, can you can also put it in run if, uh, if, it is, if it is only temporary. If you put it in ETC, it's of course permanent. Um, interestingly, the other two, so you can put it in the directory of the image as well, or you can put it in the parent directory if you use a directory to boot from. With these two, if you put it there, they are allowed to, the containers are allowed to have higher privileges. So they can, uh, you, can you, you can give them more, more privileges so they can actually get a bunch of capabilities. If, if the spawn file is one, in one of these directories, you are not able to raise the privileges of the, of the container because these these directories are untrusted, whereas this one is only available to the system administrator. So this is uh, this is what it uh, what it could look like. 
if I would make a drop in like this, I will tell them, well, don't uh, uh, use, uh, don't boot, run this within the container as process two. So insert a small, uh, small shim. Uh, user foo means uh, run this as user foo within the container. So the container has a user called foo, and that will be used to run this process. I'm running it in ephemeral mode, so no changes will, will be written to the image ever. Um, going to create an overlay, so I have two directories on my host that are being overlaid, and uh, I'm going to mount that in SRV foo. And because I would really love, love, love this, this service to not have any not within there, I'm just giving it an interface. So this is all nice and dandy, but we, we like some more control. And this is where machine CTL comes in. So has anybody ever heard of machine CTL already? Apart from you, Peter? Okay. Has anybody worked with it already? Okay. Did you like it? Oh, good. So machine CTL, it's, um, it, is a, it is a tool included within, uh, within systemd as well. Uh, you can use it to inspect machines. It's actually uh, able to control the state of, uh, of, of containers. And it is a registration manager. Uh, it's not only for NSPON containers. You can also register uh, libvirt uh, machines in there. It is, uh, it is really a machine controller. So you can register any other services in there as, uh, as well. And you can execute a bunch of operations. So it is automatically started when the machine.slice is started, which is automatically started whenever you run one of these nspawn add services. Um, it keeps track of all the running containers, and systemd then takes care of the processes. It will optionally allow you to have local resolving of the machine names. So if you have 15 machines running, each with a different name. You can use uh, NSS My Machines within your resolve, uh, no, within the e, uh, uh, within the NS switch, to actually look up these names from uh, well, to actually have resolving for this. And the machines can be controlled with machine CTL. A machine CTL can start, stop, uh, enable, disable. Okay, this is I thought I had that slide. Anyway, it can uh, so it can start, stop, kill, reboot. So it can actually send the proper signal to the init system to do a um, to do a good to do a uh, good reboot. And it will uh, allow you to enable and disable machines to run at startup. And if you enable one, it will just create a symlink to the uh, system system spawn at dot service with a with a proper name. Machine CTL also does image management. So I said before, there is no real image creation or distribution within the, within the NSPON world, but there is a way to get images in and out of the system. Uh, these are stored in var lib machines. And uh, if you have this, uh, if you run within systemd NSPON at services, I recommend putting it there because it uses the dash dash machine switch, which will look <coughs> in that directory by default. Uh, it can, so it can download images and directories, it can actually verify them, it can, uh, it, so it can do checksumming, checking, and it can <coughs> verify uh, uh, PGP, hash or, sorry, PGP signatures. Uh, you can clone a machine, so if you have, if you have two con <coughs> if you have container image, you can clone it to something else. Uh, you can rename things, uh, you can import, export images and directories that you have. Um, so it says everything you need. Oh, it's super unreadable. <laughs> So, so terrible. So, if you get the slides later on, <laughs> what I'm doing here is I'm doing machine CTL pool tar. So I'm pulling a tarball, and the link is to uh, Ubuntu Bionic Cloud Image root file system. What it will do, it will download the tarball. It will even download, because, uh, because it knows that it is Ubuntu, it will also download the signature file, and, uh, and it will verify the signature. Uh, it, it does this in the background, so you can, just like with uh, Docker pool, you can control C it and it will just go on in the background. So you don't lose that uh, system, or you don't lose the, the data. And you can use list transfer to see if your transfers are done yet or not. 
Ah, okay. Apparently, I turned some things around. So uh, the container management you can do with uh, with system, uh, sorry, with machine, CTL. You can start stop, enable disable. You can uh, log in and use shell. Uh, the difference here is if you use machine CTL login, it will actually spawn a real login shell on that PTS. So you actually get the username prompt and then a password prompt. And if you're running an older Debian, I think in Buster this is disabled now, but if you're running Debian stretch in a container, you are not able to log in as root because this is done on dev PTS 1 and that is not in secure TTI. So if you create a stretch container and you want to log in, you have to actually do some, uh, you have to fix your uh, secure TTI. Uh, you can use shell, uh, which I guess is quite similar to what docker exec bash does in a container. So you just get a root shell in a container. Uh, it even has an option for you to say, okay, I want the shell as another user. Uh, you can copy files to and from the container. And you can, with a running container, bind mount a directory in there while it's uh, while it's running. Um, you can. I should have listened to Peter. He said, "Oh no, the, the contrast is bad." I'm like, no, it looks fine. But yeah. So um, you can list images. Uh, it will tell you what it's called, what kind of type it is, if it's read-only or not. You can actually yes. Why do you have an image called lost and found? Because I mount a separate directory or I mount a separate file system here. Ah. And there's always a lost and found there. <laughs> um, so you can actually create images <coughs> and mark them as read-only. This means that if you, uh, if you start it up as a, as a service, it will actually run in ephemeral mode anyway. Uh, and you can use this <coughs> with the clone or template commands to create new containers from. So you can have base images that you can use. Um, so here you can, uh, so with clone you can do this, if you then run start, it, uh, it boots, you have machine CTL list and it will list all the containers that are running. Uh, because uh, systemd looks in uh, Etsy OS release or userlib OS release, it will tell you what OS is running in the container as <coughs> well. And uh, it will also tell you the IP addresses of it as well, as it uh, as it has dbus access to the to the machine that it's uh, in. So if you would run a machine CTL status on a machine, it is very similar to what happens if you run a system CTL status on your host system. You can you, you can see when it was booted. You can see uh, so here for instance what the root where the root file system is, what the interfaces are called, what addresses you have and uh, the tree of units that are running and uh, the log as well and when it's uh, you can open up a shell so you can just do machine ctl shell my machine um, and you can do everything you can do in a normal machine anyway um, another nice uh, nice thing is because the, this this machine is now registered i cannot use nspawn again on it uh, you, if, if you have the, the slide, you can see it here. If you're running n spawn <coughs> minus m, so I want to do something within a machine um, that is already running, it will tell you, sorry, the directory tree is already busy, <coughs> or the image is already busy. I will not do what you ask of me, because I'm not spawning another instance of a running container. So it will, uh, it will, it will prevent some of your foots uh, being shut off. Okay. So, just one question. Yeah. It's been a while since I had a look at system D and spawn, but that seems to me you know, like something between a traditional virtual machine and uh, Docker, Cryo, yes. Podman, Runtime, yeah. which you can do crazy things with layers, but that seems something in between, right? Yes. And you can yes. even attach a bridge. The bridge part is really interesting because you don't have to, to configure the network and with flannel, etc. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, um, so. It's, so what, what I find uh, nice about this, it is, um, it has the simpleness of Docker uh, if you don't run any weird stuff around it, mm -hmm. uh, but it does have the power of more traditional VMs in there. And uh, as, a, as a system administrator, it is a nice, I think it's a nice balance between having the super complicated setups and having something that does uh, consolidate well, but is still separated from the host system. Yeah. So you're saying Leonard actually did something right? Uh, uh, yes, I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am. 
I, I must admit, I am not a system D hater. I really love the concepts. I really like the way it. Um, I, I like the way it works. Actually, I, I don't have problems with it. It is different, and that is why people hate, hate it most of the time. Um, you can uh, so because it's integrated in the full system system D uh, ecosystem. Let's say <laughs> you can do things like sudo systemctl minus m name of the machine enable <coughs> some service and it will enable the service within the container if it's there uh, if it's not there the container will uh, it will tell you the container is not running or hey the service file has not been found um, and uh, it's running so from the view of the container it's actually running in the system D slice but if you look on the host system, it actually runs in a machine slice. And then within the machine slice, there is a machine, and there is a new uh, slice for the, um, for the resource grouping as well. Uh, Peter? Yes. I'm suddenly slightly confused, or maybe not suddenly. Uh, what kind of operating systems can I boot? Um, it or can, can and spawn boot? It can technically boot anything that has uh, that has system D as an init system, uh, but it will attempt to boot anything that has a bin in it or an sbin in it. Okay. That can that is okay with your kernel as it stands, yes. right? Yes, yes, yes exactly. Your so no BSD or whatever. I have not so tried. It, it no. must be a Linux. Yes, yes. It must yeah, be it must be Linux. Well, must technically, you could run free BSD on Debian, I think. The kernel. Do they still support it? The Debian, that, yeah, that's, that's Debian kernel. K FreeBSD, but yeah. that's FreeBSD kernel with yeah. new ah, user yeah. lens. And they don't support NSPOD on that, I guess. No, I don't <laughs> think it actually has systemd, because systemd uses Linux-specific yeah. uh, things. Uh, so because of the integration, you also have journal CTL on your host that will allow you to inspect the logs of the containers. Just use the minus capital M name of the machine, and you have access to all the logs. and it's uh, and you can use all the same tricks that you use on the host as well. So minus u, the name of the uh, of the unit, and you can inspect the unit logs on the uh, from the VM, or sorry, from the container, but on the host. So there is no need to actually ever log in into the uh, into the container. You only see the uh, output from this machine. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to really fast, so that, oh well, nah, I'm fine. So there's a bunch of ways to build images. So everybody probably knows how to build images for Docker, and everybody has probably at some point did it the bootstrap or what have you. If you can do this, you can build images for NSPAWN as well. So you can use the traditional bootstrapping tools like the bootstrap, DNF, backstrap, zipper to create an OS tree. Um, then you would probably want to set a root password or do some initial configuration of uh, authorized keys to be able to log in later to the, to the container. And uh, the systemd container, uh, it's, it's good if you install it in the container as well uh, because it uh, contains the link file, at least in the older Debian as far as you know, it contains the link file for the virtual Ethernet interface to automatically start uh, start connecting if you have the network D enabled. So, but that's 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 like hard. That's hard mode for uh, for OS uh, images. So the systemd people also made MKOSI, which uh, stands for Make Operating System Image. Uh, it can build operating system images, but it can build a bunch of different images. So it can build a directory, which is just an OS tree. It can build a tarball of that directory which you can import into machine CTL again. It can build a raw image with a GPT partition table. It can do locks on there. Uh, you can specify the partitions. So it will, and this, and this image, so the raw image with the GPT disk, can, you can actually boot them on bare metal. You can DD them to a disk, plug it in an EFI machine, and it works. Um, you can boot it in a VM. You can boot it in NSPALM. You can boot it whatever, because it's just a disk image. Um, and it supports checksumming and signing of these images. Uh, there's another tool called CA Sync, uh, also from the systemd people, which is Content Addressable Sync uh, system. And I don't fully grasp it yet, but it's like a, a marriage of Git, which is Content Addressable, and RSync. 
So you have a content addressable thing that you can pull images from. It's I, I, I don't fully get it yet, so this is, uh, this is why it's not mentioned on the slide. Uh, one of the other things, by the way, uh, I have not mentioned about uh, NSPON, is it can boot OCI images as well. So if, you, if you're already running something with the Open Container Initiative images, you can boot them in NSPON. It, uh, it can just get the JSON and will do whatever it has to do to make it work. So how does MK OSI work? Well, because it is by the same guys that made System D, it looks very, very, very <coughs> similar to what you uh, what you would expect uh, a unit file to look like. Uh, you can just tell it, well, what distribution do I want to uh, want the image for? Uh, what release? What output target do I want? Uh, so here I do a uh, tar, and what packages do I want installed? Well, I want System D container installed. And then you just run sudo MK OSI. Um, you have to do it this route because it uses uh, loopback uh, to, to do the installation. And then you get a image star tarball, which is 75x. Uh, you see here I have an MK OSI cache directory. If you create this directory before running MK OSI, it will put the uh, images, or sorry, it will put the packages in the cache directory. So if you would run this again, it does not have to go out to the internet again to pull in, to pull in the packages. Uh, MK OSI is somewhat restricted. It knows about Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, CentOS, Arch Linux, and some other distributions. It knows how to how to build these images uh, because it also does a few tricks like installing network D and enabling network D, these kinds of things. So you cannot build an image for every operating system, but the important ones are covered anyway. Um, has another bunch of features, so you can do you can create a post installation file, which will be run after the after the initial image has been bootstrapped. You can run whatever you want, and this can also integrate nicely if you already have Puppet, Ansible, whatever, because you can just run your playbooks as a post installation step anyway. This is during image creation, yes. not later on. Yeah. No, this is during image creation. However, later on, because it's uh, technically it's uh, it's a full machine, if you if you boot it like that, you can run Puppet in there, you can exactly. run Chef in there. And I read that there are so, that there is some work going on in Ansible to have an NSPON connector. So you would be able to use NSPON to connect to uh, machines and uh, containers running on the local system as well. Uh, well, once you've created this image, you can just use machine.ctl import tar, image name, and then the name uh, where you want, uh, how you want this machine to be called. So, you can, everybody has already probably a million Docker files everywhere. So you can just do docker build, minus t, give it a name, latest, Go to Varlet Machines, create a directory for it, do a Docker export, pipe it through tar, <coughs> and you have your directory that you can directly boot via NSPON as well. So you don't need to change anything if you don't want to, except add one step to import it. And I've actually seen people using this, uh, using this to migrate off Docker because they had networking issues and docker and, um, and putting host network devices into containers is not as friendly i, I believe as yes as so NSPON. There, there's no machine ctl hub right no so this also gives you a million images to use yes the only caveat is you have to actually uh you actually have to run the container once mm -hmm. for the file <coughs> system to be exportable uh, in uh, previous versions of NSPON, you could actually import Docker file systems directly, which was uh, .dkr .dk uh, files, but Docker changed the, the way they create images, so they deprecated that in Docker, so it's also impossible now to import them via, via NSPON. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, so I, I worked like I said, I did most of this stuff from the man pages and uh, just a lot of furious typing on the, on the terminal. And system the it offers long-lived containers. It uh, offers a full integration within the system the ecosystem that most of you have running in production anyway. Uh, it is a pretty simple solution for system administrators that do not need the image layering, do not need all the big 
container orchestration frameworks, uh, but it does have a lot of cool building blocks that will allow you to do more advanced things. And I believe that is it. So if anybody has any questions, then I'll be happy to answer them. Any, any idea how heavy it is? I mean, what, what's the overhead in running these containers? Almost nothing. Okay. It's only namespacing. So yes. It's just like uh, OpenDB or... Yes, it is just a bunch of other processes that are running as well. And if you make your container image very small or only run, <coughs> and not even run an init in there, but just a single, uh, a single binary, then that is the overhead on, on the runtime. On the startup time, it for has to create some namespaces, but that's peanuts. Right. Anybody else? All right. So I have some other bits and pieces. Well, like one, I think, but... Uh, no, no. Oh, well, well so actually, so, like uh, I said before, the resolve cont from the host is copied into the container. If you're running a local resolver, which is pointed to one, and your resolve cont says 127.0.0.1, that is copied into the container. And the container has its own local loopback interface without a name server running. So, the... Remember this when uh, when you're doing that because I've, I've been bitten by this a few times already. Uh, easiest thing to do is to have a drop-in file with a custom resolve conf that is pointed to whatever other name server that is running as well. The other. Could, could um, <laughs> yes. With regard to DNS, is, uh, there is also a, a MSS. Uh, plugin MSS My Machines, I think. Yes. Um, which allows you to resolve all your uh, containers just by the name you give them. Uh, yep. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned this earlier as well. So if you're if you're running a bunch of containers, uh, you can access them by name if you uh, if you enable this NS uh, and NSS My Machines, uh, which is also properly documented in uh, section eight of the mod pages. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's uh, hardly readable, but uh, if you see here, I'm looking at Varlet Machines, My Machines Home, and you can see that it is owned by VU My Machine 0 and VG My Machine 0. So, virtual user, container name, <coughs> user ID 0. And if you look at the actual user ID, it is like 10 million something something something. Uh, which actually shows you that this is the, this is the Chona namespacing that I was uh, referring to, and that's that, that's also visible if you do uh, if you do a PS. So it, you also see these uh, you see your system be running as the VU my machine ID zero user as well, which I find quite neat, and uh, I believe that's it. So uh, ten minutes early.